said, I'm going to keep it very basic, essentially just trying to very briefly review. But first of all, you know, Marcus's title was actually very provocative, but also great title, very demanding, making sense out of vice to resolve. Something like that actually would be very appropriate and probably the right way to have this discussion would really have a debate. You know, like, essentially, how sure are you? The bicep 2 has discovered what, you know, a lot of people now claim has been discovered and for that or, you know, particular reason. But in, because of the shortage of time, I just didn't have time to do that, okay? So instead, I'm basically going to give you a review of what most people think is the answer. And you should think of it essentially as a benchmark. If you want to believe it, great. If you don't want to believe it, great too, okay? Question it. I believe it, but then that's just me. Okay? Um, I'll tell you actually what about the real reason, the, the real aim I have here is basically to tell you why I believe it. Now, that's, that's the best I can do. So, you know? just why you believe it, the interpretation theoretically, but there's a that, lot of experimental questions about background and stuff, right? Before I, I think at this point, given, given we'll put it this way, there will be a lot of back and forth on the actual details. Okay. In my mind, I'm no expert to be able to judge this, but in my mind it seems to me that they're very confident that what they are seeing is what we are accepting them, claiming overall. The precise numbers, you know, is it going to be r equals 0.2 from primordial gravity waves? Is it going to be 0.15? Is it going to be 0.1? Okay, that will move. Okay. Uh, personally, I have a prejudice, okay, based on essentially boneheadedness, which is that in the end it will come down to 0.16, just because of the fact that that's what harmonic oscillators predict. Okay. But that, like that's totally boneheaded of sorts. I will actually give you a little bit. Less of a boneheaded argument uh, that actually supports the idea that oscillators do it, but then of course the oscillators could also have slight unharmonicities as well, so that you know these numbers can in fact move around some. Okay. Uh, nevertheless, from whatever they eventually get nailed down to, I, I think we stand a chance to learn something more. Okay. So you're going to start from the point of view is they are seeing B modes, and these are from uh, some primordial. That's correct. Okay. That, that, that's really my like starting that. premise. Yeah. Absolutely right. Okay. I mean, I'm not qualified to question, you know, the 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 foreground. Exactly. I'm not going to do that. And, actually, and there will be more experimental. Actually, the the the, the, the we'll put it this way: the talk we had last week, I personally felt was extremely persuasive. I think these guys were very clever. They have integrated as much knowledge as they could about, you know, about those foregrounds, essentially gathering information from generations of astronomers, gathering that, zooming in on what apparently seems to be the tiny section of the sky on, on, the, on the southern hemisphere that is allegedly the cleanest when it comes to dust, and modeling this in the best way possible. That doesn't make it perfect, but it was done very clever. Moreover, they had instruments which apparently have absolutely you know, pushed forward the detector design in, in basically very little time by practical year generation. The improvement of factor sensitivity by a factor yeah, 10 by basically taking these cameras and putting them on microchips, I felt was absolutely amazing. Okay? Moreover, I think also, given the experimental issue that, you know, th th there are other few comments that, that, that the speaker made, okay, which were basically that, you know, they also have this thing they call the tech array, which is essentially five detectors, like bicep to integrate together, and they're already beginning to apparently look at the data, get, they have two, two years of data from that, and, you know, he, he even mentioned something about some kind of preliminary cross-correlation between single detector and the five and so on, but we have to wait, okay, that is for sure. The fact that he went out of his way and basically, you know, put, put the head on the stump, saying that they've excluded r equal to zero with seven sigma, I find, you know, it has to be, it has to be a reflection of extreme confidence in their behalf. So, but, but, but we'll have, again, we'll have to wait, okay, at least until November when pre presumably Planck will come with exactly. independent less than a year, so okay. that's this the best a, thing. So, can, can that's another thing you can say is, just a little bit, but I think we're probably at the place where the only way that you can the only way that you can sanely 
attack the, the experimental data from BICEP2 is via foregrounds because they've only released the one frequency. But if you want to explain all of it with foregrounds, it's totally going to blow our understanding of how you know, extragalactic dust is distributed in the universe. And, and Thank you. Thank you. I, I, you I, really I, have to rewrite astrophysics. But right. yeah, I, I just I think what Rob said, and I, I share the thing. Just the abstract of their paper uh -huh. only excluded foregrounds to 2.3 sigma. So there you go. It's, it is what it is. That's what they said. The, 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 well, look, I think, the, I think the, I'd really like to hear, yeah, about hear the theory yeah, of this because right. we can have this discussion yeah. in the hallways. Right. Okay? The flames, I've got to go. The, I've got to go at five, so I'd I like agree. to hear this talk. The, the thing is, the, I'll just say, I'll just summarize this. I, I think that you know the, the the messages I was getting from the experimental community in the talks and privately were stronger than that. But you know, okay. again, let's see. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to go be there. So therefore, I'll assume that that's the primordial right. time. Yes, it's a fine. Moreover, moreover, I'm going to assume that it, I'm going to talk about inflationary mechanism for producing it. There are claimed in non-inflationary alternatives. Okay, in, having a discussion about that would be interesting. Eventually, in my view, they're all problematic when compared to inflation, conceptually, in the sense that at some point they have to use. Certain certain bit of magic to, to, to sort out just what the amplitudes of these these fluctuations actually are, or rather how to connect the amplitudes of fluctuations, presumably calculated at early epochs, to what they have to become in the late epochs because of the certain region that involves UV sensitivity that inflation does not have to deal with. Okay? So basically inflation, just as a review for, for you know those who may not be not sufficiently familiar with it, has been essentially forwarded as, as a paradigm that addresses these, this list of cosmological problems which come from, you know, in some cases, millennial observations. Which, you know, to leading order universe is big, old, uniform, okay? Because of the fact that gravity is an unstable force, it shouldn't be. <coughs> And this can be quantified very precisely. There is, in fact, a very precise paper due to Stephen Hawking back in 76, Hawking and Collins, that basically tells you if you just take plain old GR and a space-time filled with photons and, and, and billiard balls, you, you ain't going to get the universe like ours unless you fine-tune with some ridiculous precision. And you can quantify that precision depending on just where you place to, where you pick, what energy you place, energy density, what scale you, you, you you choose to specify your initial conditions, but if you insist you do it at a Planckian density, then the fine tuning is one in ten to the ninety. Okay, if you know, so so bottom line, it has to do with causality and the fact that that, that gravity is an unstable <coughs> force. And so this is essentially the illustration of the issue. A simple illustration is if you just consider, for example, the so-called flatness problem. The fact that apparently uh, the Euclidean the, the, the spatial slices, the X, Y, Z geometry intrinsic to the universe at some fixed time t appears to be so close to Euclidean, you know, that the 14 elements of, the Euclid, of, of Euclid from God knows when actually fit it so perfectly is an issue because of the fact that, that generically it doesn't have to be the case. Generically, you can actually realize the conditions of homogeneity or uniformity in at least two other ways, and of course in many more approximately, and, and then the question, but the question is basically that if you do so, if you, if you allow them to be slightly curved, then there is the question of just, just how, how could it be that, that you're not seeing the, the clear signature of such a curvature at the present time? Because a curvature of the universe, if it were present, would contain some energy and it would steal some energy from the cosmic expansion or add energy to that. And so you can actually measure it and place bounding, bounds on it. And the observations tell you that this is less than about 1% now. And the issue becomes, when you compare how that relative energy density, effective energy density carried by the overall geometry of spatial slices, scales relative to other constituents of the universe, photons and billion, billion balls. And they scale differently with age. And so you find out that if you actually want to start with some universe, like which was... Which is which is which is which which you allow to be curved, but no more than one percent now, 
and you want to, pro to, to, to extrapolate that back to some previous time, epoch, previous era, you find that you need to choose to find you in this initial condition that you choose for the curvature contribution at that previous time, basically by the ratio of the square roots of the energy density now and then. If you push <coughs> this energy density, this initial surface on which you assume the universe has you know, been basically set up and released and allowed <coughs> to expand or whatever it does, to be, let's say, Planckian density, this number becomes 10 to the minus 60. So it tells you just how little that initial curvature has to, has to contribute back then in order to still not be more than 1% now. And if you, on the other hand, take into account you know, what, what interactions do. You are in some, let's say, environment where you have strong force now, namely gravity. Gravity in high energy is a strong force, okay, because the effective coupling is controlled by the energy scale at which you observe in the units of Planckian mass squared. Okay? You would have actually expected that whatever can carry energy at that time would, in fact, eventually equilibrate with everything else. And there would be a, no reason a priori that, 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 that such, a, such a tiny little curvature that you had set up, set up would last. Now, somebody could say, well, the curvature is a constant and so on. Sure, but basically, if you just, all it really means is that if you take a large inhomogeneity, a large overdensity or underdensity at that time, okay, in the interior, sufficiently far from the boundaries, it behaves just like curvature. And that's really the statement that you're after. So you can, in a sense, just think of the curvature as the avatar of homogeneity. There is also something called a horizon problem. Namely, that the universe now appears to be essentially homogeneous, uniform, down to ten, one part in 10 to the 5, over roughly 10 billion light years. But you can then ask, okay, if you project that homogeneity scale back in the past, how big a homogeneous scale you needed to pick the universe to be at that previous time in order for it to continue looking homogeneous now? And again, a simple scaling argument actually tells you that homogeneity scale relative to the horizon scale, which is the size of causal contact, okay, scales is the ratio of the temperatures that the universe then and now. And what that means simply is that if you then scale this, if, the, if, if you start with this being of order one now and scale it to some previous time, you will immediately find that the homogeneity scale that needed to be chosen by hand is many orders of magnitude larger than the scale of causal contact. So the, in other words, you need to pick the universe to be uniform over larger and larger regions, essentially telling particles that never had a chance to be in causal contact, to interact with each other, to uniformize, to actually occupy exactly the same state, roughly speaking, the same state, with one, one, with the precision of one in ten thousand, in, in, in what is it, hundred thousand? <coughs> okay, and that again is is very nasty fine tuning. Now. You can choose to address these things in various ways. But you can also basically be, you know, again, maximally boneheaded and minimalistic and simply say, I want to find a way of trying to fix these issues, these fine-tuning problems, in a way that appears to be fully in, <coughs> you know, fully Copernican, in agreement with the physics that you, that, that you learn about in a lab. You know, essentially, uh, whatever mechanism being this, being still subject to the usual rules of quantum mechanics and relativity. And that's where inflation comes in. And very roughly, heuristically, what it does, it, it takes your random universe, typical standard universe, which said, uh, let's say is very curved at some early epoch, and very inhomogeneous. And in a very short time, prior to the evolution controlled by the standard stuff, namely photons and billiard balls, what you do is you, you, you invent some other agent, something else that controls the evolution of the universe, to make it blow up really fast. And the way to do it, now you will hear often these statements that what you get is you get superluminal expansion. Now, what, that, what does that mean? Superluminal expansion sounds like a, you know, a no-go by the rules of special relativity because nothing can ever expand superluminal. You can't move faster than the speed of light. Right? If you're an inertial observer, that's right. 
Okay? But if you have non-inertial observers, they can move at relative velocities as much, you know, however fast they want, relative to each other. Just take a turntable, okay? And if you could make the, the you know, the, that brown piece of vinyl very rigid, which you really can, but it doesn't matter, you can basically just make it very large and, you know, turn it at some constant angular velocity and look at the tangential velocity of the guy at the edge. And if this thing is sufficiently large, because it's not inertial being accelerated in order to be kept at that edge, it can move fast. So same thing he comes in here. What you need to do is essentially find some agent, some, 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 let's call it fluid or whatever, okay, that ends up dominating the evolution of the universe. And by that, what we mean is whose energy density scales differently than the energy density of photons and billiard balls, so that it can outlast them. And if that happens, and in, in the process, it also starts pushing things away farther and faster, okay? you end up essentially having a lot of expansion in a relatively limited course of, course of time. So I just put the students in the room. I, 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 Go on. I have to object to your turntable analogy. I don't think that's correct. But I think all you need is you just need the amount of space between distant observers to be increasing more than the speed of light, which is not the same thing. Actually, you I'll bet. have a material object going faster than Yes, you yes. Know. Actually, actually, so actually, that's not, you, you, that, by principle of relativity, whether something is moving faster than something else, space is being created, is, uh, in fact, impossible to discern. But we can go about that later. Well, in any case, your turntable is not, you know. no part of your turntable is going faster than the speed of light. But distant particles are having the distance between them increasing faster than yeah, I think we'll have to disagree on the on the semantics, but that's fine. I'm but, not gonna. I but is what I said true that distant parts of the universe end up being causally disconnected from it? Eventually, yes. In fact, actually, even if you start with certain things in a causal contact, but relatively spatially separated, and you just let it run, okay, for as long as you like. Eventually, in such a universe, everybody will get causally disconnected from everybody else in a finite amount of time. But something stopped inflation. Exactly. And here we are. Okay. Exactly right. Now, if that were, of course, to never end, we would end up with the so-called problem of empty universe. Right. So obviously, this agent shouldn't be absolutely stable. I don't know if this is the right moment, but we might come back to some of this. But I, I and I think a lot of people don't think Inflation solves any two problems as it's understood now. And a simple way to say that is just that you assume a lower entropy universe when you have inflation than you did before at the beginning. And I, obviously, we, sh we shouldn't debate this here, but I just want to go on record as. Well, that, 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 I, I think, think what that inflation is good for is the perturbations. Yeah. That, that depends on the attitude. What inflation solves and what it doesn't may depend on the attitude and the argument. I will certainly uh, claim that inflation takes a lot of the fine tuning problem. It takes a, a lot. Well, it, it, it phrases it in a very interesting way. I'll, I'll grant you that. But <coughs> I think whether, whether it solved it or made it worse until we really clarify what. It makes it is. look less bad. Well, I think that's an illusion. It just may, saying, I mean, you when you talk about the entropy, it makes it look worse. Is it low fair? entropy is tuning. It, you assume a lower entropy when you have inflation than when you don't. Is it fair to maybe say that? Depends on the entropy of what, but as you know, that we, we 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 need to. Yeah. So we we should sit down and talk about the, this. Yes, absolutely. Yes. That depends on just what entropy we talk about. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. When you add it all As up. you know, I will tell you that what it really does is it hides that entropy yes. someplace else. Yes. But let's not and, get and, and into, I'll even into, grant, into that. What, so what I will grant is it hides it in a place that's very interesting and where you where where right. it's you're tempted you you, you you tune much more readily without questioning. And, and, and that's well, you are really forced to tune it by uh, yeah. uh, insisting on the on the on the validity um, of field field. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So so we. We, we probably totally agree, but I think I think like whether that's something you just snuck it in with another assumption you already were happy to I'll, 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 you know, I'll put it this way. I think that what I'm still saying is still valid as long as you insist on field theory. The question of whether you should, how much you should be insisting on field theory is exactly a deeper so that, and broader that, question. Yes. And, and and so in fact the 
the thing you've done is map the tuning on tuning you were willing to do at a drop of a hat when you did field theory. Right. And that's and that's great. I actually think that's great, but it should right. be recognized as such. So it, it, yeah. Let's call it this way. It depends on who probes it. So on who? Who probes it. Probes it. In a way, but yeah, you know. Yeah. Now, okay, so, so when it when, back to common photons and billiard balls, okay, as long as they're the probes. What happens for them is basically that what we have to do is we invent this agent, we somehow, as long as it keeps this expansion rate approximately constant, the expansion rate being the logarithmic derivative of the scale of the universe, or the size, if you like. If, if you like the characteristic distance between two fixed observers that just sit in some at some points of a coordinate grid, okay? Then, because this is a logarithmic derivative of the scale, essentially you will find that, that the scale grows exponentially with time. This is during inflation. This is during inflation. So H changes somehow. Now, the question is just what is the microscopics behind this H in order to find out the proper answer to your, your question or rather, rather, you know, comment. In the end, we want that H to change because if it right. didn't, you know, stop, if it did not change its behavior, okay, this would continue forever. You would end up essentially with the universe. Now, you see, the trick is basically the following. Any other energy density that you look at, in the presence of such, you see, these, these P's for photons, P is a third of the, of, of the energy density. For the billiard balls, P is zero. So let's say just for the billiard balls, if you look at some energy density they carry at a particular time and ask, this is nothing else but just the energy conservation, or if you like continuity equation. Okay? So it's put it this way. Let's not even solve the equation. Let's just count the energy. The energy of a billiard ball is given by its rest mass because it's not, not relativistic. The energy density is the, 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 that characteristic energy scale, namely the rest mass times the number density. The number density is inversely proportional to the volume of the universe. The scale factor that characterizes the volume of the universe is growing exponentially, therefore the, the, the volume is growing is the third part of this. So practically in no time at all, what that really means is in a few units of inverse H, this exponential suppression will basically make all the billiard balls in the universe initially essentially disappear completely. If you like, they will have the density goes down, the number density goes down because the volume grows exponentially quickly. What that really means is that actually they're they're being pushed away from each other to humongous distances. And as a result, this dilution leads to <coughs> the energy density dropping exponentially quickly away. If that were to continue forever, you would never have galaxies. So, now the question is, the question is basically, how do we design this, this dynamics that gives us this H to be approximately constant? So let's be pedestrian, let's, let's require, let's be very basic, let's just, let's just assume <coughs> that whatever it is, is maximally minimal, in the sense that it obeys all the usual rules, you know, Poincaré symmetry, locally, Equivalence principle, you know, standard second order differential equations ensuring locality, causality, all that stuff. Let's assume also that it basically gravitates, again, principle equivalence just like any other normal thing. So, if we want to have local point carré, that means we are not going, we are guaranteeing that no preferred directions will ever be introduced in the evolution. If, which is what we want, because if you introduce preferred directions and have exponential expansion, that, prefer, that, that can lead to very large asymmetries in principle. At least it's a worry, okay? If you want to ignore all this, okay, what you start with is a scalar field. So start with, a, let, let a, put in a scalar. Let it gravitate. If it gravitates, it sources the local geometry using the Einstein's equations, okay? It obeys its own equation of motion. There is some potential that you provide it with, okay? And uh, the source that it provides for gravity is given by the standard stress energy tensor. That's just the equivalence principle back in action. So now the question is, what potential do you want? Let's focus now on the zero mode first of this field, namely homogeneous mode. That's actually not a bad assumption to begin with, to look at, to begin with, because after all, you want a universe which is roughly homogeneous. If the, if the scalar field were very homogeneous and if those inhomogeneities were to survive, 
you would not end up with a universe that's very homogeneous. Let's actually then justify the, 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 why this is valid dynamically in a moment. If you just consider the zero mode, and then look at the structure of the sources for the Einstein's equation, we can characterize them basically by the fluid approximation, essentially defining the energy density and the pressure. And of course, this is just the standard stuff that you would have gotten in mechanics. This is just the Hamiltonian, and this is just the Lagrangian. <coughs> so you compare the two. Okay? They are now sourcing the background geometry. Now, the trick is, remember that, that funny equation from the previous slide. This conservation, energy conservation equation that tells you how any energy density they look. Okay? The trick is these two terms. You want this agent that's sourcing H, because this H is the solution of Einstein's equations. You want the agent that sources it to have energy density that approximately doesn't change. The reason you want the energy density to approximately not change is if this is a roughly a constant, then H is roughly a constant. Forget this term for a moment. Okay, so that means if you want to actually model your agent with a scalar field, you want this pressure term to be roughly speaking equal and opposite to energy density in order to ensure that this is approximately zero because if that were the case then the rho would be constant approximately and you would of course have a self-consistent set. If you do that moreover then by the fact that H gets to rho is approximately constant a goes exponentially. This term becomes exponentially small really quickly. Okay? And moreover, oops, all of the spatial fluctuations of your scalar field, you see what you start with is basically if you like a substratum of this scalar, a condensate of sorts, but it can fluctuate locally, of course. But if the zero mode dominates in such a way that pressure is approximately equal to negative energy density, and then that geometry gets set in, then all of these spatial fluctuations, in fact, get damped exponentially quickly too. Again, the reason is that it's just the equivalence principle. It tells you basically that any physical wavelength of an object is given by the number of ticks you can fit in a full period in your coordinate system times the scale that sets up the actual physical length between the ticks, which basically means it's multiplied. You, you take the number of ticks and multiply it by the scale factor A. So that means momentum, that, that's the wavelength. The momentum is inversely proportional to the wavelength. Hence, all the spatial momenta to this equation contribute as 1 over A squared, and you can drop them. Effectively, <laughs> if you think about this scalar field with whatever potential, some kind of, a, I don't know, an unharmonic oscillator and so on, and, you know, it does wiggle, 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 and then if the pressure is right, eventually, and by eventually I mean quickly, okay, this wiggle, wiggle in the substrate actually just freezes. Okay, the sp fl spatial fluctuations just say, uh, uh, over. We have no right to move. The reason, physically, is can causality. You can't have a wave fluctuating if its wavelength is bigger than the Hubble scale because the parts of that wave, if you, of the... Of the, of the this is again a kludge, but think of a sonic wave, okay? If you look at the wavelengths bigger than the Hubble scale, okay, the, 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 the particles that are oscillating, that would be oscillating, don't know they should be oscillating in the right way because they're in the outside of the causal context with each other. So H is related to V of phi in a direct way? Or? In a direct way by virtue of Einstein's equations, by, by, by virtue of this and this, that translates, when you truncate only to the zero modes, which is an approximation which becomes valid very quickly to this equation, this is just your standard Friedman equation, which you can literally think of as the conservation of energy in the exponent unit. Is that an exercise you can see that? Okay. Basically, all the off-diagonal stuff in this structure goes <coughs> to zero because it's proportional to these, okay? Diagonal stuff, the, the, the spatial momenta also drop off, and this zero uh, approximation actually becomes extremely precise, extremely quick. 
In the process also, whatever initial fluctuations of the geometry were there, they also get diluted and stretched out to much larger distances and separations. Now, the trick, of course, is you need to make sure that this, this thing, this substrate, has a constant energy for sufficiently long, not forever, in order to end up getting a chance to make galaxies at the end of the uh, but, but for long enough. Now this this is probably the, this is the Slorol affair, okay? That ha that basically has been, in a sense, probably the simplest and the most robust way of getting inflation to actually do what you want it to do. And the idea is very simple. The idea is take an arbitrary potential. Now the question is, that the, the idea is very simple. The, the actual realizations, the dynamics of getting this quite right is not so simple, but never mind that for a moment, okay? Take an arbitrary potential and then place your field, your initial value of the field sufficiently far from the origin. Now, it wants to fall down into the origin by the action of the restoring force imparted on it from the potential, okay? But it's doing that in a universe which is expanding quickly. In a universe where all the, what that expansion means, that this, this velocity that this particle has going down, actually behaves as a fluctuation that is getting bled away by the expansion. <coughs> if you like, what's happening is it's getting redshifted away. Now, the analogy, the precise, where, where, where that comes from is if you actually, well, let me just see, I didn't write that equation, but that's, that's simple enough. This equation here, when you write it down and focus only on the zero, zero mode becomes phi double dot plus 3h phi dot plus the fourth gradient, okay? In flat space, you just have an you know, unharmonic oscillator type equation, okay? But due to the expansion, you have this. And remember, the h is approximately constant, okay? But that basically, the question is basically, when is it, when is that a good approximation for a long time, okay? Now, for that to be approximately constant, you need that pressure to be almost equal to energy density, but you, you need something else. You also need the potential to not be too steep. If the potential is too steep, if you start from here, you just go boom, okay? If the potential is actually relatively, you know, let's say, acceptably non-steep, what can happen is that whatever acceleration you think you should be having towards the minimum of the potential will in fact be overcompensated by this effective friction electron. The idea, the analogy, okay? Take a pen view. Put it in a jar of high quality, very sweet honey, which has a lot of viscosity. Now displace the pendulum from the minimum. Of course, it wants to go back into the minimum under the influence of gravity. <coughs> but all that sugar in that honey is preventing it from doing it quickly. But nevertheless, it's going slowly, slowly, slowly. Now, put in the expansion of the universe. How do you simulate the expansion of the universe? Start pour pouring some solvent into the honey. Let's say you want to make mulled wine or something. So take a good wine and start pouring it into that honey and give it time. Eventually the honey dissolves, the viscosity drops, and the pendulum just goes after a while. You know, it does its trick. And that's the end of inflation. That means, mathematically, you need to make sure that certain conditions that, 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 that you know, the potential you want this field to have, it has to have a potential, otherwise you'll never get a pressure, you see. You have to have a potential, otherwise, look, 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 just look at when this is true, okay? This equation is true given the, 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 the if you like, definitions of P and rho, when you can drop the kinetic energy, okay? Then you just have exactly P plus minus rho and everything is fine, okay? As time goes on, kinetic energy slowly picks up. Remember, honey is getting dissolved. Okay? And then eventually, this starts to, to not be true very well anymore, and that's an inflation ends. And mathematically, that basically means that the, 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 the potential can't be too steep, and the, 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 sec the curvature of the potential cannot be too significant. You see, this, this simply tells you that the kinetic energy at a given time will be subleading to the potential energy. 
And this condition actually tells you that the, the time that this condition is satisfied needs to be long. So how abruptly does inflation stop? Model dependent. This is very model dependent. But if you take the slow roll inflation, okay, that now seems to be favored by bicep, then the actual end is fairly smooth. The process of reheating, of dumping all that energy, what will happen is basically inflation will go on as long as this is moving slowly down. Then eventually it will start to oscillate. As it oscillates, it actually, by couplings to normal matter, to usual stuff, it decays, it transfers its oscillation energy to it, and reheats the universe by repopulating it with photons and billiard balls. It need not oscillate if you remain critically or over damped. In some sense. You will not damping right. conditions down here, right? The point, of course, is that once this condition of slow roll starts to end, <coughs> H starts to change. It's not going to be constant anymore. It starts dropping down, and you go to a different regime where then, in the end, H will be not sufficiently big to critically damp it anymore. Okay. Roughly speaking, the trick is that what you're really going to be doing in the end is actually comparing second derivative of the potential to h. And h is a function of time, of the epoch of the universe in which you measure it, and uh, the, the potential is basically just a local Lagrangian. But let me move, move on. Now, bottom line is, but you see, bottom line is actually that, that while you would think, therefore, that you would get a very smooth universe, in the end, you actually don't, really. <coughs> The point is that this inflaton, this, this you know, frozen substrate, these, these bunch of oscillators which are frozen in the same phase, are actually not frozen perfectly. They wiggle a little bit. Okay? And the reason they have to wiggle is the uncertainty principle. So what happens is you can now look at the quantized theory and essentially calculate just how those little oscillations around that, that sort of intermediate frozen substratum stage evolve as a function of time. And long story short, what happens is when you manipulate the equations a little bit, you basically obtain something which looks like a Schrodinger equation, but in time. This is not a Schrodinger equation in space. These are time derivatives. K squared is the, 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 the co so-called co-moving momentum. Okay. And this quantity A, that's just the scale factor of the universe, and the time here is actually something called the conformal time, but never mind that. Okay? That's a detail. The point of this, this, basically what will happen, where, where does this come from? Take any second order differential equation, and there is going to be a trick of changing variables, both independent and dependent variable where you can write levels. Period. <coughs> okay? That, there is, you know, it's a little theorem in mathematical physics, nothing more to it. It's it actually sturm will fear. Now, what you do, you look at how a wave with a fixed k evolves in time. Okay? And, a, and, a, and an intelligent way to look at that evolution is to plot the amplitude of the wave as a function, to use the wavelength, the physical wavelength of the wave as the clock. The reason is that during inflation, Remember, the physical wave is the co-moving wavelength times the scale factor of the universe, and the scale factor is exponentially dependent on time. And so the physical wavelength and time are in one-to-one -one correspondence, and you can use your clock whatever you want. Okay? And when you solve this equation, the, the, the trick here is very, it's very simple. If you just look at this mode, as long as, as, long as the k squared is dominant relative to this, term, you just have a free harmonic oscillator. Okay? But the physical variable, this, this mathematically convenient variable that you introduced is related to the physical variable like so, it's phi over A. Okay? That actually means that as long as you're in this regime where the, the, the frequency, the spatial momentum is the dominant contributor to the evolution, you wiggle, 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 but the amplitude is in fact going down as 1 over A. And this you can even infer simply just by virial theorem. If you just take a, a wave and put it in a box and normalize it, okay, the norm will be given by the inverse size of the box. And now you should just go to the physical box where the balls of the box are 
getting away from each other. And you will actually therefore immediately conclude physically that the amplitude of this wave has to go as 1 over the size of the box. And that makes sense. And of course, if, for example, you were in some universe where uh, uh, expansion was slow, this, this dilution would continue forever. But in inflation, that's not the case. The trick is that in these so-called accelerating universes, <coughs> this is a growing function of time. Okay? It looks like with other you know, small changes to initial conditions, you can get drastically different. Yes, it seems so. It seems so. The trick there is that when you actually look at what happens when that quantity starts to dominate, okay, what happens is that actually the, um, the physical amplitude of the mode approximates a constant. The intuition is in fact very simple. This Schrodinger equation is extremely telling. When you go and write this in terms of your physical time, that in this conformal time, okay, the equation becomes phi double prime plus a squared minus some factor. It's two, but it doesn't matter. Over eta square eta is this this conformal time equal to zero, right? So you see that this is phi. Now th this conformal time has a peculiar nature. It's actually defined to run from minus infinity and zero. Okay. That's just a map of mapping the normal time. That's a mathematical trick. But what it tells you is that this effective barrier, because this looks like a barrier in the Schrodinger equation, barrier in time, because of this 2 over eta squared, has a pole at 0, and it grows extremely large. And what your wave does with a fixed frequency in a fixed background error of time, because that's how it's propagating, okay? It's climbing the barrier. Its wavelength is getting stretched as long as it is classically allowed. But once it enters, it splits into two modes, one exponentially growing and the other exponentially decaying. And the reason is that because of your boundary condition, just coming from the causality and evolution, there can be no reflected wave. This exponentially increasing mode looks completely frightening. But it's the exponentially increasing mode of the non-physical field, of the auxiliary field that you're introducing to simplify the analysis. And when you look at the physical mode and properly normalize it, you see it goes to a constant. This doesn't happen in universes which don't accelerate. It can't. What this really is, is the statement of causality. If you take a wave which oscillates, in a region which has a finite size of causal contact, namely given by the horizon scale, the wave, by its nature, okay, its amplitude is decreasing, <laughs> like so, and the wavelength is getting larger, being stretched exponentially, as long as the wavelength is shorter than the size of the horizon. Once it gets bigger, the different parts, if you like, of the wave don't know they need to be in the phase in just the right way to oscillate. So one mode disappears, the other mode actually goes into a constant, and that's that. This is extremely important. The reason is that it turns out that the actual normalization constant, this value of the amplitude, after the so-called, this is called horizon crossing, and the phenomenon is called the inflationary freeze out of the perturbation of the super horizon modes. Okay? It turns out that this amplitude of this mode after the wavelength gets bigger than the horizon, is in fact in the, roughly independent of the wavelength. It's this famous scale invariance that you're hearing about, that, you're seeing, that they're seeing for the scale invariant spectrum of scalar fluctuations. Mm -hmm. And the reason for it is again that you're in slow roll inflation. Actually, what happens, at the, you know, for experts, the statement is basically that of symmetry. The background, this interspace, has in fact a conformal symmetry which is realized manifestly in this spatially flat slicing as, in fact, a shift of time coordinate, proper time coordinate, and a rescaling of spatial coordinates. And it tells you basically that the, the different momenta behave the same at different times. And it, because of that, as they exit the horizon at different times, having started, let's say, at the same time, but with different wavelengths, 
their amplitude is nevertheless going to be actually fixed to be a, a, almost exactly the same value. If h were exactly constant, that would indeed be the case. Because, however, h is changing slowly because it needs inflation needs to end, scaling variance isn't exact but only approximate. And that's, of course, very important because it's actually one prediction of inflation that you can experimentally test by measuring the amplitudes that, of fluctuations you see on the sky as a function of scale. Okay? Slow down inflation with quadratic potential predicts something called the spectral index, which is basically the, 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 the derivative of the, of, the, of the density perturbation with respect to scale to be 0 .9, 0 0.96. Okay? The measurements give you 0.96 plus change. Okay? And, you know, okay, that by itself is not the proof of a specific model of inflation, but it is nevertheless a prediction of most models. Do we know the energy density value when inflation ends or the temperature of the universe? No, we, uh, uh, well, we let me skip this business with causality and so on, okay? But now we, we do. Now we do. The trick, of course, is what we measure, these densities, let me call, me, let me call them P scalar, okay, power of, of uh, stored in the scalar perturbations versus P tensor, okay? This, there is, the, you know, there is many different ways of writing this and so on and so forth, but basically the point is that let me put square root, just to be heuristic. These are the heuristic quantities that one gets, okay? This one you can write down as the scale of inflation H, the size of the Hubble scale during inflation H, in the units of M Planck, divided by a root of quantity called epsilon. And this epsilon, epsilon, is the ratio of kinetic energy to potential energy during inflation, the so-called floral parameter which is measuring the longevity of inflationary state, okay? So this you would have naively expected and estimated to be actually the natural scale of the field fluctuations of an arbitrary scalar field, or in fact, for that matter, component of pretty much any bosonic field, okay, in an inflationary epoch by doing your counting of zero-point fluctuations and using uncertainty principle and so on, okay? However, the point is that the scalar fluctuations produce the source for the Newtonian potential distortion of the metric, okay, which amplifies the impact of the scalar fluctuations on the metric by this one over epsilon factor that appears in the denominator. The tensor perturbations are just directly present in the metric because that's what they are, okay? If you like, the, the metric itself is at some level uh, an expectation value of the gravity, okay? And if you look at a linearized graviton, the way how it affects the metric is simply just through this ratio directly without this one over epsilon. In the past, that, what that tells you, this number is what you measure, okay? But there is, in principle, a priori, a lot of model dependence that you may eventually get because the number that you measure is given by the ratio of the two numbers you don't know a priori. Until now, that is. Because this is what the tensors measure. Tensors actually nail this factor and push it to be the, you see, because, because, because measuring the ratio of these things to be 0.2 tells you that the tensors are in pretty much the largest they can possibly be because the only way that you can, you, can, you can play with is essentially dropping the scale h once you have fixed this ratio to be 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 5, sorry, because that's what the COVID measure. See, what I'm really saying is this number is not a prediction of inflation by itself, okay? This number is the measurement. It's the fit. It's basically Kobe went up and saw that this is 2 times 10 to the minus 5 at 50 for before the end of the inflation, and that's what, you, what you're given. Then you fit all your numbers to that, and you have a plethora of ways of doing that until that is you measure this independently. This is, in fact, this real miracle of, 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 of pi sub 2, if it's really true, right? Now, there are technical issues that I'll maybe just glance over in terms of how you get that potential to do what you want. Okay, and this is where, you know, a lot of theorists are getting excited about at the level of, you know, just model building itself. Because of the fact that in this slow roll inflation that I have been advocating so far, 
to get this you know period of inflation to last long enough and that actually means depending on some details between 60 and 65 default 60, 60 and 65 units of inverse edge okay minimum probably a bit more just to set things up right initially and so on but nevertheless okay if you th these conditions these conditions if you want to have this this large field for all inflation which maximizes this parameter Tell you that the initial value of this field phi needs to be at least an order of magnitude bigger than one scale. Okay? Oops. <laughs> that sounds like a big oops. In fact, in fact, you would think that this is in fact a total disaster. I'm gonna tell you that it's not. Okay? It's difficult, but not impossible. What you need to do is essentially have arguments using symmetry clearly that are going to save you from this. What but, but, on the other hand, this also indicates that whatever model, this is also potentially, this bug actually may be a true feature of this class of the models, because it does make them really sensitive to an extent. And the tricks that you have to do to jump to the hoops in order to make sure that you can at least have some faith in the reliability of the calculation that you are advocating, okay, is in fact useful because it can tell you, it can, it perhaps it can teach you something about the UV, phys UV physics that you otherwise are going to have, you know, a hell of a hard time access. So basically the bottom line there, very briefly, it's, it's the quantum corrections to the potential. It, you know, it, if you start with just perturbation theory, it's going to be radiative corrections. Having this potential to be, I told you that it, it, it has to be pretty, pretty smooth, okay? It can't be too steep. But then I just told you that it has to be pretty, 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 pretty smooth over a range of 10 units of Planck mass, 10 to the 20 jevers. Okay, that's but in, that sounds like a you know very tricky thing. And so when you look at quantum corrections with such large fields running in loops, okay, this is a bit of a misnomer, but nevertheless, bear with me. I will quantify that in a moment a little better. You worry because first they can in fact affect the functional form of the potential, producing corrections in the in the you know. If, effective action expansion, bring, bring, bringing about irrelevant operators that you thought were negligible, okay? And secondly, it can also affect the parameters, so the, uh, renormalize the, 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 the scales and couplings that appear in the Lagrangian that you want, essentially telling you that thinking that you were, that the potential is smooth enough, you were just foolish. It wasn't. You tuned it and then the tuning came to, to bite you. Well, Tricks are, uh, the, the, the story, you know, the, the, the common, the common worry, the common worry was that, that, okay, loop corrections themselves, let's say just think for themselves interactions. Imagine you have in that potential something, a term like lambda phi to the fourth. If you have lambda phi to the fourth, you start with porting potential, sure, right. Is it porting? Of course not. Because when you calculate all the loop corrections, it will have, it will, the potential will contain terms which have arbitrary even powers of phi. Not, why not a lot? You can impose, you can impose uh, parity symmetry, just a discrete symmetry that, that prohibits other. Fine. Where is the problem? The problem is that these high powers, just by dimensional arguments, have to be normalized in the units of some scale, that, and that's the scale of the, of the field that runs in the loop. Okay? Some mass scale of the object which you're integrating out. Namely, the inflot on itself, or at most, the Hubble constant, because those are the only scales that you have in the problem. But no, remember, the, the Hubble constant is significantly lower than Planck mass. It better be, because gravity wouldn't make any sense. Einstein gravity would be impossible to use. And I told you, field needs to be 10 times the Planck mass. So this, this number, this ratio is huge. And then you raise it to huge power. And then the worry is, okay, this totally destabilizes the potential. And then you consider this when you apply just to the quartic potential for the infloton, and you actually realize that the rescue comes in terms of the pesky powers of i to the n. Because in the Feynman diagram, you have that imaginary unit, you have even powers, you are going to get an alternating series. And even if it's not mathematically speaking uniformly convergent, it actually does converge, approximately, to a log. And this we know, this is called the common wonder potential. Effective. And so the, the potential, this potential doesn't get deflated from the inflow itself. I'm actually lying about something, but I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'll tell you in a moment, okay? 
I'm lying about this guy, but you know. Then you say, ah, well, you know, there was a paper in 83, hey, no, I'm lying, 85, by Enquist and uh, Malampi saying, well, what about graviton? The quantum gravity loops will also destabilize the potential. Turns out that prior to that claim, there was actually an actual calculation of the effective action uh, for, for in, in the context of so-called induced gravity, renormalizing the potential of a scalar field by gravity loops, finding corrections like this. So you start with standard Einstein gravity, and you add to it terms like so. <coughs> now, this is the second derivative of the potential of the scalar field. Okay? This is the Einstein tensor. This renormalizes Newton's constant. Okay? By what? You have m Planck squared plus your effective Lagrangian becomes, you start with m Planck squared times r, and now you add to this, this piece. But this piece is the measure of the curvature of the inflaton potential, which you are choosing to be flat to begin with. This is much smaller than Planck. So you are normalizing, yes, but by amount, which is absolutely tiny. Inflaton potential gets extra contributions proportional to the potential itself times these corrections, which are because of the fact that they involve gravity, they come from graviton loops, all involve power of M Planck in denominators. But these potentials are small in the units of M Planck, and so are their derivatives. So this correction is tiny too. So what gives? Suddenly, suddenly all of the troubles appear not to be relevant at all. The answer is actually that basically perturbatively, what's going on is that the, the, the flatness of the potential, okay? is controlled, is maintained by an approximate shift symmetry. <laughs> Namely, if the potential were exactly constant, the theory would be invariant and the phi goes to phi plus constant. What breaks it was the fact that the potential is a bit steep. That means, in other words, that, that, that this flatness, this, this symmetry is broken basically by weak dependence of the potential on phi. Perturbative corrections don't break the symmetry any worse. They simply communicate the, the symmetry back to the Lagrangian by extra powers of the terms that already break it, but because they're small to start with, the powers are small, even smaller, and you don't have a problem at all. So actually, this is perfectly meaningful. The one thing where I cheated was this bit, because this is, in fact, quadratically divergent. What that really means is it tells you that this, if this inflaton couples in some seriously interesting way to some heavy physics that can run in the loop, then it will get a correction that involves the mass scale of that heavy physics. For example, if you have direct coupling of the inflaton by, let's say, some Yukawa to some fermion, which is heavy, and it will be heavy because inflaton itself, being 10 times M Planck, will make it heavy no matter what. If this coupling were present, you would get a correction of the inflaton mass of order M Planck at least. So you have to prohibit such problem. If there is new physics, you have to prevent relevant or marginal couplings to it in order to basically tame the hierarchy problem, because this is nothing else but just a standard hierarchy, gay hierarchy problem of standard model. So how do you do that? Well, you find a coupling which respects that shift symmetry. How? Well, derivative couplings. They can do job perfectly. I'll now just give you you know what, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip certain things, let, let me not be, I'll, I'll tell you about something which, which I'm interested in, in particular because we're actually just finishing a paper that is a follow-up to this, which is something that was started in 2008, and we had written a follow-up in two years after that, and now yet another, and the reason is that it actually gives you a manifest low energy theorem, the theory that in fact actually does these tricks in things automatically. So take something, this is a 4-4, four four, okay? This is a 4-index generalization of the Maxwell field. So remember, F mu nu is equal to D mu A nu minus D nu A mu, okay? Now take some object that has three indices, is a completely antisymmetric tensor, and build a completely antisymmetric derivative of that. And that's your 4-4, four four, okay? And now, in four dimensions, because this is completely antisymmetric, it has to be proportional to the epsilon symbol. That's the only antisymmetric object you can have in four dimensions. So it really tells you that this whole structure has really only one degree of freedom. Some function that multiplies the volume element. 
Okay? Now, the equations of motion for this that you get, you vary the action. You get basically the, you know, an analog of the, of the Maxwell equation with more indices. The equation of motion then tell you when you apply the symmetry constraint here, just tell you the ordinary partial derivative. You have to work with the equations, but it tells you the ordinary partial derivative of this Q is zero. That's what it is. Sorry. Yeah. I just read somewhere that uh, some teacher is now being embarrassed because he had a rule that, that, that if anybody's phone rings, then they have to put it on a speaker and, you know, expose themselves publicly. So. But you need, I turn it off before you can mail it. <laughs> but bottom, line is, uh, bottom line is that this Q is just a constant. So basically, you have a field theory of a form, which is in a sense just a field theory of constant. So why is a field theory of constants interesting? Well, actually, they're not constants if you put in sources. Okay? In other words, if you put J nu, if you allow charges. Now, what are the charges? Charges for a Maxwell field are point particles. Charges for a three-form potential that has a four-form field strength are membranes, bubbles, if you, <coughs> bubble walls. Okay, so if you stick them in there, actually, this this constant won't be exactly constant, but it will jump every time you nucleate a, a wall. Okay. In any case, let's expand this theory. Let's let it gravitate. Why? Because of the fact that this has been this is this is one of the cornerstone ingredients of the landscape mechanism for adjustment to the cosmological function. How you do this in in, in the story of the landscape? Well, what you do is you start with some effective cosmological constant, which is the bare cosmological constant plus this term. This term is locally constant until you nucleate those membranes. And whenever you nucleate the membranes, its flux jumps in the same way that a flux of the electric field changes if you produce a pair in the, between the parallel plate capacitors and the lines break. Okay? So every time that happens, this diminishes, and the net value of cosmological constant in the interior of the, of the bubble actually gets smaller and so on and so forth. Fine, let's add it an extra term. Let's just add a simple little term in there, which is actually allowed. It involves a pseudo-scalar, which you start with as a massless guy. You add this coupling. That's perfectly possible. No symmetry prohibits it. So why not? OK? Well, what's particularly interesting about this setup is that, you see, in the absence of this term, this ma clearly manifestly has that shift symmetry. Phi goes into phi plus a constant, which I told you is a good thing to have at least approximately if you want to build a model in place. Now you stick this term in here, and it appears, to, well, it, this, is, this looks like explicit phi dependence that breaks shift symmetry, right? Because if you now shift phi by a constant, the Lagrangian changes by this term. The trick is that this term is a total derivative. Remember that f is a total derivative of a. That anti-symmetric derivative is, in fact, a total derivative. So this is just a boundary term. And boundary terms don't change equation. So shift symmetry is still fully in power of this theory. OK, so fine. You have a theory that has an extra bit that appears to have shift symmetry. Therefore, you know you're sort of hopeful, OK, this is good for whatever quantum purposes if you want to protect this theory from higher order corrections, etc., etc. Shift symmetry is there. Why is it useful? You can do the equations, but there is a very simple trick. You see what this looks like because it's a bilinear. If you ask how the field phi propagates, it moves on its own, but then it mixes. This is like flavor oscillations. It mixes with, with f. Okay? So if it starts as a phi, to go from point A to B, it can just stay itself. Or it can oscillate once into the form field and then oscillate back into itself. Or it can do it twice, or for that matter, any number of times. Well, the trick is that as long as it is f, it doesn't propagate. It's locally constant. So it just stays constant here. In other words, for this field to go from place A to place B, you're not paying the price in the inverse transverse momentum. Sort of jumps. Which means you can just shrink this together and treat this as just a mass insertion circle. 
integrating the field F up completely. And this, of course, this rule, this system of Feynman rules, this is called the Lippmann-Schwinger equation that you can sum because it gives you a geometric theory. That actually tells you that the pole of the naive propagator isn't at zero in the real propagator, but it is shifted to some new square. It means that this theory that I just written, the funny theory, is in fact a theory of a single mass of degree freedom. That is protected by shift symmetry. That I have only broken spontaneously, having chosen a particular value of f, having chosen a solution. In other words, if I integrate out f explicitly, I can rewrite my funny little theory in this form. Where it's manifest now that phi has a potential, it's quadratic. And the shift symmetry now is given by the fact that this number here, which represents an actual magnetic charge of the form f, is in fact not really determined in the action. It's an integral. It's, 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 sorry, it's a dynamical variable that you have to write equation of motion for, and you have to choose the solution, the flux of this field. And the shift symmetry is simply the statement that if you shift phi by a constant, you can change the flux by some appropriately chosen constant to cancel it, and the symmetry is still there. Now, okay, that all looked pretty ad hoc -y so far. Interesting, mind you, but ad hoc. -y. But it actually gets better because, you know, then you go and you try learning a little bit from your friends who actually do eventually learn some string theory and so on, and you realize that. What this is, in fact, is a descendant of something called, well, it, it, it's a descendant. It comes from a, a, a so-called churn simon sector of 11-dimensional supergravity. But, in fact, more universal, it comes from, there is a whole lot of different, different possible compactifications in string theory that will give you low-energy theories like this. Okay? Specifically, I'm giving you here just one example where I'm basically writing this and, and you know, looking for an ansatz, which is a consistent solution of the theory, and then dimensionally reducing it, ignoring a huge, huge detail, which is that if I have an 11-dimensional space, which I split into internal seven dimensions and the four dimensions I want to call out space-time, these must be fixed in order for me to continue thinking I live in four dimensions, not 11. In other words, the sizes of these dimensions, which in 4D look like fields, need to be stabilized, need to be, you know, decoupled, okay? And in any case, that in itself is in fact, at this point, a big industry in string theory. It's the learning how, all different ways of how do you stabilize this and so on and so forth. Well, let's just move uh, forward. The point is that, this, well, I'll, I'll just give you a summary of this. I'm not going to bother you. The point is that now, once I've written that effect low energy theory, with that shift symmetry, which is operational. Provided that I maintain the shift symmetry by appropriate coupling of this scalar field phi to other sectors I want it to decay, give me precisely to leading order a quadratic potential with that parameter mass, uh, with that parameter mu that measures the mass, to be given by some calculable, calculable quantities in high dimensional theory which are definitely going to be smaller than the Planck scale. In other words, it will give me a potential which is protected from corrections with its curvature, second derivative of the potential is the mass, yes, that is significantly smaller than the Planck scale. That is the prerequisite for maintaining the slow roll conditions for interest. Over large excursions of the field. Why are the excursions of this field large? All I need to do is to make that effective M Planck for the initial condition of phi to choose the big flux Q. Okay? That's the trick. This is, in fact, eventually we recognize that this is, in fact, a variant of what's called another inflation. And next Monday, we are having Eva Silverstein coming down from Stanford to actually coming up from Stanford to tell us more about, you know, her story, the con continuing developments in her story, because they're writing, I think they're probably working on, oh, I don't know, two, three papers at least right now. I know that for a fact, but you know, who knows. But the bottom line is, okay, there is, there is you, you have to worry at least in principle about non-perturbative, let me skip all this. 
Ah, these are, we are actually writing a paper on these. You see, these are these little un un unharmonicities that you can derive from the theory, starting from higher order correction that your string theory gives you, and computing how they shift the potential. And actually, because this is now big, having been essentially measured, because that's what we measure. H is equal to mu phi in these setups, in these large field inflationary models. That's what it is, okay? Uh, divided by M Planck. But remember, phi is 10 M Planck, so therefore H is equal to 10 mu, okay? That, that, that we measure, this we know. This now, it turns out that this product, mu square phi square, is roughly, if you look at literally at the Bicep data, is right squat at 2.1 times 10 to the 16 G. To the fourth, obviously. That's what it is. That's the number. Okay? Now, you take some, some string theory, typical compactification and so on, that, that they talk about very often it's God scale that appears as the UV cut of the control higher order correction. So suddenly, thanks to this, you get correction which is Let's say order one. Obviously, things would be a bit smaller. You need to make sure that it is a bit smaller for this story to be meaningful. But nevertheless, it's kind of there, ballpark. So it does other things. And, and you know, story, story, story. Worry, worry, worry. Let's get to the to the tiny bit of the of how we end this. Just the relevant part. Here is the Lagrangian, which allows you to reheat without breaking shift symmetry. You take some, let's say, gauge theory that your standard model is embedded into it. Okay? This is trace GG star of some gauge theory that contains the standard model. Maybe, maybe, maybe it doesn't have to. It depends on the details of, of the model building. The trick is that you can now calculate the decay rates of the input at the end of inflation into the gauge sector of this theory. It will lead to a reheat temperature given by the uh, geometric mean between the decay rate and the Planck scale. And that's basically given by the three powers of the of the of the mass of the of the of the inflaton, which which we measured, which is basically 10 to the 13 GeV, divided by this coupling, and you know it is what it is. Bottom line is that you will get the reheat temperature to be easily 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12 gel. Okay, from that point on, okay. You just have, you, you, you will need, of course, this, this stuff that you reheated directly into to be in equilibrium with the standard model particles. That's why I'm saying that, that okay, the, the, this is what you can technically say. This is some large gauge group that contains the standard model that eventually gets spontaneously broken only to SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. All other stuff getting heavy and decoupled, maybe becoming dark matter, maybe being absolutely unstable and decaying completely and dark matter is something else. I don't know. Okay? There is a lot of model pendants there. Anyway, this, uh, this contains just these, these bits. Ah, ah, here is the thing. Why? The, the final thing, okay? You see, there is this thing referred to as the light bound that dates back to a paper from 96 by David Light. It's essentially a calculator. What this is, this, 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 this integral, very roughly, okay? is related to the integral that tells you how long inflation lasted in that slow roll regime. Okay? Essentially, this integral controls this ratio. There is something called the consistency condition that tells you that this ratio is given by this integral. This, this R here is the ratio of this quantity to this quantity squared. Okay? By definition. It's simply this, this now, this, this, of course, there is an assumption. The assumption that goes in this equation is that inflation is single field slow roll with large initial value. Okay? Provided you make that assumption, okay, the fact that you're in slow roll tells you that a lot of calculable parameters have to be related to each other, essentially, because during slow roll, you're in this overdump. You think of it this way. You're solving a bunch of second order differential equations in a system which is critically or overdump. Okay? That means that when you solve second order differential equations in a critically dumped or overdumped region, some of the integration constants are irrelevant. Okay? That means you have only one independent integration constant per equation. Okay? As a result, 
when you nail that number to be something numerically, which you do by performing one type of measurement and relating it to your calculation, all other numbers are related to it. That gives us this consistency check. This is the statement that of how you link the field excursion in the field space to the measured tens uh, ten tensor amplitude. Okay? If you take this to be 0.2 as claimed by Meister, this is whatever, you know, square root of 20, what's the square root of 20? 5 or a 4 something. Okay? And indeed, at face value is the first indication of there being something physically meaningful with Planck and, you know, trans Planck and scales, which in fact probes it and gives us information about that. So let me stop here. Let, let me not go on anymore. Because, you know, the rest, well, okay, I'm sort of at the end anyway, but, you know, there is more details and so on and so forth. And, you know, I'm, I'm well, if you want to ask me some more questions, by all means. But, um, you know, the story here really, I'm not really telling you how these calculations were performed and so on and so forth for that. You know, come and take my class next time I give it. Okay, because we, that's basically what we do there. But, but um, the, the, the message here, okay, the real message here is that, this calculation assumes essentially the system of quantized harmonic oscillators on a gravitational background and produces the results which are in great agreement with the observation. At face value, if you don't take it to be an actual confirmation of gravity's quantization, nevertheless, it's still a very strong indicator that this is the case. Because so far, all other attempts to reproduce this failed in its face. You had a uh, series, uh, power n, alternating series. Uh huh, sure. And you said that it uh, converges. I don't see how that is possible. By that I mean logarithmically. Logarithm. Log. So log. log. It, it, it's been sun. This is the common common binary resummation. Okay. Converges. It's in the details. I understand exactly what you what you are asking about. I also took some time to convince myself that, in fact, it does add up to a law. But basically, the, what's really going on, because it's an alternating series, the terms that are adjacent to each other actually cancel mutually, order by order. Is the ratio that you have raised to the power n greater than 1? Remember, it? alternating series may end up actually even converging at the edge. Okay. So, I just want to reinforce a big picture Go on. question, which I know, Nemanja, you're, you've, you have articulated over the days yes. better than anyone, but it's just stunning that this last, in the lower right-hand corner here, this equation is telling us that we have measured the scale of inflation. Yes. And it means, we may have, I mean, it's stunning that we've got that, and it means that just a huge percentage of all models have been ruled out. So. This is it's, it's an amazing. You um, know, I, I well, right, absolutely. I, I, I'm I'm trying not to not, not to not to risk making a statement I might yet regret, given that the numbers are, <laughs> if, if you know, still a little play, soft and yeah, so yeah. on and so forth. But I completely yeah. wholeheartedly agree with you. Yeah. I mean, okay, so no. yeah, condition on this holding up, the the implications are. Stunning and my my prejudice, prejudice is this absolute boneheadedness. Okay, you know, take the simplest thing and make it work. And the, the fact that it does seem to work, I mean, it's yeah. basically a miracle. All of the, you know, if you look at all of the other models of inflation, in a certain sense, they were working very hard to avoid making this one. Yeah, if you know, where where was and like they're all complicated. I mean, you look at this modular inflation with inverted potential. You look at God forbid hybrid inflation. Let's not even mention power laws and you know all, all that other nonsense. 
Somewhere someone showed a slide. Oh, sorry, I don't know let, if it was here. Let, let me was, not was, forget was the, the first hundreds one, right? of models of inflation. Just this whole slide just chock full. You've probably seen it somewhere. I forget. Probably Rocky. Rocky used to go around. Yeah, and other people with yeah. billions and billions of models of inflation. Justin, do I've seen it worse than Justin showed. Oh yes, but, yes, absolutely. But most of those are just gone. That's it. Right. And, and, and it's it's a big relief. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's not let's not forget. Yeah, and but you know, let, let's wait a little bit longer. Okay. Well, uh, here is why I'm sort of taking a little bit. Just the numbers. Okay. Are gonna move. Okay. Yeah. Exactly how much? Right. Let's let's wait. Why am I saying this? Remember, I mean, until bicep. Okay. You know. A lot of people, even even Andre, who basically came up with chaotic inflation, were pushing Stravinsky. The the first thing ever written that was recognized to be inflation in these guys, in a theory that never really made any sense, okay, seemed to be you know the best fit to the data, prompting you know a whole cottage industry over the you with know R past four years zero. at least. Yeah. Okay. With R uh, we are basically zero, and now, of course, the fact that you know we can go back to sleep and ignore all that is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> That's big <really. laughs> But let's wait. Let's wait. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> I usually, when I'm the speaker, I usually say that too. But just wanted to make sure that point, less technical point, was was there. Absolutely. Yes, if there's nothing more. Thank you.